Federal law allows citizens to reproduce, distribute, or exhibit portions of copyrighted motion pictures, videotapes, or video discs under certain circumstances without authorization of the copyright holder. This is called fair use and is allowed for the purpose of criticism, news reporting, teaching, and parody, which doesn't infringe on copyright under 17 U.S.C. 107. Open up you, my lips, and let my mouth show forth your praise. Kuma, Yehowah, we are put so o ye veyaka, we are new so misanecha bifanecha. Kuma, Yehowah, we are put so o ye veyaka, we are new so misanecha bifanecha. Arise of you, O Yehowah, let your enemies be scattered. And let those that hate thee flee from before thee. Let all of Yashara, Yisrael, who love, worship, and praise Yahweh, give him thanks by saying hallelujah. Shalom, fam. May the Ruach HaKodesh lead you into all truth and show you things to come. And may the seed of the word be planted in your heart to bring forth the fruit of righteousness. Hallelujah. In the name of Yahusha. And today we're going to talk about the fact that the 144, the remnant and the candlesticks are the ones who will open the gates and windows of heaven that no man can shut and also shut them. To the window, to the wall, to the wall, to the window. This is the big come up. And so I'm going to show you how this all works in terms of prophecy and scripture. Let's get into it. So family, one of the great secrets to the two candlesticks and the 144 is Pesach. Because whoever shall lose his life shall gain it. Two candlesticks and the 144 is very much tied into the mystery of Moses and Elijah, as well as Yahusha coming out of the tomb. Because the lamb was bound four days before it was sacrificed. And we know this is 400 years and that both Moses and Yahusha fasted 40 days. And we are returning from the four corners of the earth. When we discuss the two witnesses and the two candlesticks, we are discussing the doors and windows of heaven being opened. And didn't Yahusha open the door of his own tomb and then stand and ascend up to heaven? He came up out of death. And so this is another way that we tie in to the sacrifice that the two witnesses and the two candlesticks will have to make and their connection, their going up and their connection to the door of Eden. Because I believe Yahusha's death and where he was buried in the tomb or whether he's at the cave of Machpelah the cave of return again a second time, which is what Machpelah believes. I think this is tied also into the rise of the 144 and the two witnesses up to Mount Zion and actually Eden. And so let's start first, family, with this scripture. And this scripture is about the offering. Because as I've shown you, the lamb is an offering. 
and Israel will present themselves as a living sacrifice, the two witnesses and the two candlesticks, and go up. And so we've all heard this when people are, you know, in the church are saying, tithe, tithe, we'll open up the windows of heaven. But family, this lesson is about the window and the wall. And of course, the wall is really the ladder to the set apart place, to the window, to the wall. All right. You know, they sing it in the clubs. <laughs> and so family, these are the same windows that will open once the 144 and Israel go up and they literally create a highway of righteousness by doing this. All right, that all nations will stream to one by one during the Great Tribulation. And of course, we're going to show you who gets caught up at the end of the Tribulation. But the whole of the one-third remnant of true Israel are the Church of Philadelphia, the Church of Smyrna, the Two Witnesses, and the 144. Because all Israel will be saved. And so Israel will be ready in the day of battle, prepared. As in Psalm 110 says of the two witnesses, Yahuwah said to Yahuwah, sit at my right hand. This is the actual real translation. Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, Yahuwah will extend your mighty scepter from Zion and you will rule in the midst of your enemies, and your troops will be willing on your day of battle. And this is the 144 family. Okay, and oftentimes people say the 144 represents the males because they are Moses and Elijah, and that was the word the Spirit said to me, that the 144 are the Moseses who will lead everyone out. The men, what does the scripture say, as he goes before the flock? So the men often represent the male number or leader in the house. And then the women and the children and those who are under age represent everybody else. So that's the one third remnant. Now, I, it could be either way because I've described to you how women are also redeemers and have been leaders in Israel. We know Deborah and Jael. And so we've already gone over some of these numbers 144,000 in the number of minutes a day, the number of prophetic years, days in, in um, the 400 years of slavery is 144,000, and the measure of the temple cubed it has the same 144 in it. So we are in a time, family, where we are being measured. We are being measured and graded right now. So keep that in mind. So the two candlesticks are caught up with the 144, the firstborn. And so the firstborn is another huge theme because Israel is my firstborn son. So this is only Israel or the 144, but the two candlesticks, of course, are Israel as well. And the church of Smyrna, which is also a type of Israel. And of course, the Gentiles will be going as servants. So they'll come along. I believe they're going to be caught up, but family, you can, I don't have the full evidence of that, but I can't see why not. So family, you let me know what you think in the chat and in the comments. All right. So let's talk about the offering. In the last video, we really talked about how the altar is prepared in the second to last video, actually. And so we'll refer to it, just touch on it, show those slides again later. But this is another discussion of Yahuwah's demand for his offering. And so this is in Malachi where it says to bring out the offering. Yahuwah says in Malachi 3 and 10, Behold, I send forth my messenger and he shall survey the way before me. So we're going to see how the angel of Yahuwah, Yahusha, surveys the way before Yahuwah in many ways as the Savior and as the angel of Yahuwah. Whom ye seek shall suddenly come into his temple, even the angel of the covenant. So we're going to hear about the angel of Yahuwah carving out the mountain, setting everything up. Whom ye take pleasure in, behold, he is coming, saith Yahuwah Almighty. And who will abide in the day of his coming? Who 
will withstand his appearing, for he is coming as in the fire of a furnace, as in the herb or the soap of the fuller's soap, right, to clean and cleanse. He shall sit to melt and purify as it were silver and as it were gold. And so I've told you many times, this is what King Cyrus returned Israel to their temple. He returned the vessels of silver and gold, but he returned the people as well, which are Yah's most precious vessels of service. And I'm skipping down to here to verse 5. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. So these are the priests. And refine them as gold and silver. And they shall offer to Yahuwah an offering in righteousness. And the sacrifice of Judah and Jerusalem shall be pleasing to Yahuwah according to the former days and according to the former years. So who is this? The sons of Levi and the sons of Judah, the king and the priest. All right. The two sons of Leah the only legitimate wife. For I am Yahuwah your Alua, and I am not changed. But ye, the sons of Jacob, have not refrained from the iniquities of your fathers. You have perverted my statutes and not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, saith Yahuwah Almighty. But you said, wherein shall we return? Now, this is not to be used as the church uses it. This is the real, this is him calling Israel to re Israel his vessels of silver and gold that will be as doves with feathers of silver and gold on the tops of the mountains. Very significant family because we're going to call back to this. All right. Will a man insult Alua for ye insult me but ye say wherein have we insulted thee? In that the tithes and the what? First fruits. So, first fruits is Passover. I'm going to do a teaching on that next week, going into the first fruits of Passover. In the tithes and first fruits are with you still, and ye do surely look off from me and insult me. So, the tithes are the tenth. We know that. The 144 are the tenth. They are the priesthood measure equal to Levi. And we've already mentioned Levi and Judah, the king priest. And the first fruits. So it's the tithes, the one tenth, and the first fruits. All right. So we see this is the 144, and it's the one third as well. These are the firstborn of this time. The year is completed, and you brought all the pr produce into the storehouses, but there shall be the plunder thereof in its house. Return now on this behalf, saith Yahuwah Almighty. See if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour out my blessing upon you until ye are satisfied. And I will appoint food for you, and I will not destroy the, land, the fruit of your land, and your vine in the field shall not fail, saith Yahuwah Almighty, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be desirable, saith Yahuwah Almighty. So this is what we are talking about today. The first fruits, how they go up. Yahuwah opens the door. The windows of heaven are opened. And this is the two candlesticks and the two witnesses. And as I've said, family, the mystery of Moses and Elijah being the two witnesses is that uh, Moses was obviously a Moses who led people out, which is what the 144 will do. And he died on the mountain. And Yahuwah took and hid his body. And of course, Elijah was taken up, but he came back down in the form of John and also died. And so we have to die to enter the kingdom of heaven if we are the one third or the one four four. So not much has changed. And the reason why I'm showing you, you know, again, uh, the, watch my video on the location of Eden. And the reason why I'm showing this to you is because it is the door to the promised land and it is in the highest mountains in the land of Israel, which is Africa family. 
And so we have the door, which is the Dalit door pathway to life to move, enter, hang. And this is the place where you bow to enter in to the path, the source of life to move, to enter into a place that is covered and has something hung over it. And noon is the seed. So in the word Eden, we have the Aleph, the Dalit, and the noon. All right. Some say it's an ion. I would say it's an Aleph. You're watching the door. And so once again, the door to Eden is opened at this time and this particular moment we're going to go into. And so whoever loses his life shall save it. And so you're going to have to die like the apostles, whether you're the one, four, four, or the two candlesticks. And these are the servants, like I said, who shall be ready in the battle for Yahuwah and the great army that shall stand up like the dry bones. Okay, we're going to see these connections. And it's very much, it's just completely written in order in Revelation. Okay, and Moses spoke. Yahuwah spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, this month shall be unto you the beginning of the Kodesh set apart time and it'll be the first month of the year to you. Okay, speak to the congregation of the children of Israel saying, in the 10th of this month, let them take each a man. Seek ye unto the congregation of Israel saying, in the 10th of this month, let every man take unto him a lamb according to the house of their fathers. So these are all, just as we said before, men who will be offered according to the house of their fathers as firstborn lambs, a lamb for each house. So that's the 12 tribes of Israel, the 144. And it shall be a lamb unblemished, a male of a year old, and ye shall take the lambs and the kids. And you're to actually bind it. Other translations, I may have it here, but you have to bind it and you kill it towards the evening. So you take it first on the 10th day, four days past, so 400 years, 40 days in the wilderness, in the desert. Yehusha fasted for 40 days. We have the four. And then you kill it towards the evening. So as you are, the sun is going down, you, in the last of the light, you kill it before the sky is perfectly even. And then you take the blood and you put it on the doorposts and on the lentil and the houses, in the houses, which soever they shall eat them and they shall eat the flesh in this night roast with fire and they shall eat unleavened bread with bitter herbs. Okay. And it shall be to you a lamb unblemished, a male of a year old, and he shall take it of the lambs and the kids and it shall be kept by you till the 14th of the month once again. Now in Jubilees, what we say, and so it says you should eat it by night on the evening of the 15th. And so you bound it from the 10th to the 14th, and then you eat it on the night of the 14th. So into the evening of the 15th. So why am I saying this family? because this is the darkest time, because these are going to be sacrificed. And this is going to be at the beginning of the darkest time, the great tribulation. So that's when they're going to be killed. This is the one tenth, which is the priesthood. They are bound for four days and they will be killed with fire. Okay or however the beast who rises up from the sea kills them. And now remember, family, this, the reason why we talk about where is the, the blood put, it's put on the doorposts and on the lintel. So that's upon which the door hangs. We mentioned that when we talked about the Dalit. It's the door upon which the tent flap hangs. Why are we pointing to that? Well, I was showing you this scripture because we said in Isaiah 6 and 13, the word for the female and the male word here, aliyah, means to go up. And it refers to the sacrificial lamb and the lintel of sacrifice and the pillar. 
So these are literally the things which will rebuild the temple, the door to the temple, because there's 12 tribes, 12 doors to the city of Israel, right? And their blood will be on the pillars, on the lintel of the door, and they will become what? We're going to hear when we read about Philadelphia again, the pillars of the temple. And this has to do with the 10 stringed harp. And so their sacrifice will rebuild the temple just like Yahusha's did. They follow in his path. And remember, it shall be, according to Isaiah 6 and 13, it shall be the 10th and they shall return and be eaten up as an elm or oak, which have substance in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. So this is a worthy sacrifice that will open the window and the door. And of course, Yahusha unseals the door because when we read the gospel of Peter and we get the account of Yahusha's sacrifice, what we find when we look closely here, and, and I re we read this in the study on the day, okay, on the Passover and the year of return, which we are in. One of the things it says about Yahusha going, being put in the tomb is it says verse 8 and 29, 30, 31, 32, 33 through 40, it says, the elders were afraid and came unto Pilate, Pilate, entreating him and saying, give us soldiers that we may watch his sepulcher for three days, lest his disciples come and steal him away. And the people suppose that he is risen from the dead and do us hurt. And Pilate gave them Petronius, the centurion with soldiers to watch the sepulcher and the elders and scribes came with them unto the tomb. And when they had rolled a great stone to keep out the centurion and the soldiers, then all that were there together set it upon the door of the tomb and plastered thereon seven seals. So remember, the 144 are marked in the seventh chapter. Um, something I'm going to show you as well, if I don't get ahead of myself, is that there were actually, remember, it is the seven priests of Levi who give a shout so that the walls of Jericho fall down when they entered last time. And it says, and they pitched a tent there and kept watch. So there were seven seals. There were seven seals on the book that Yahusha must open in heaven during Revelation. And there were seven seals upon the door of his tomb. And then when he comes out, his head reaches to heaven along with his two flanking angels that, that the angel of Yahuwah always loves to go with two flanking angels and of the two they saw their heads reach to heaven and of he, him that was led by them it overpassed the heavens so we know Yahusha is the angel of Yahuwah so this is his angelic form that he came out of the tomb in and he had just done war with death in hell. So he has his two flanking angels. And this is why the 144 are revealed before Israel crosses the water. For they are the two witnesses, the two flanking angels over the ark and with Yahusha. So it was the root of David obtained the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So there we see the parallel. All right, the seven seals and the seven priests. And so this is what I mentioned before. When the temple fell, it fell with a great shout. The word for shout is ruah. So Joshua 6 and 4, seven priests shall bear the ark, the seven trumpets of the ram's horns, and the seventh day, Ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priest shall blow with the trumpets, and it shall come to pass that when they make the long blast with the ram's horn, then ye shall hear the sound of the trumpet, and all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend every man straight before him. Right? Exciting, right? So remember, it is 
after the seventh blast of the trumpet that the one four four and the one third remnant, the two candlesticks, have gone up into heaven. That's at the seventh blast of the trumpet. So they have been warring and blasting and crying out, and they will what? They we're going to find out when we look at this that they go up with a great shout from heaven from Yahusha. Okay, with a shout, and so the word is ruah. Acclamation of joy, a battle cry, especially a clangor of trumpets and alarm, joy, jubilee, noise, rejoicing, shouting, sounding. Another strong word for this is Shabak. Shabak. They just had it in a movie. Shabak, which means that with still is to cause to triumph, to praise. To praise Yahuwah, O Jerusalem, praise Elohim, O Zion. Wherefore, I praise, <laughs> this in Ecclesiastes, it doesn't actually mean this in that context, but it's relevant in this context. Wherefore, I praise the dead, which now are dead, above the living, which are yet alive. So we know that the 144 go down to death with the, with the two witnesses, the other two candlesticks, and they raise up again to life. And so it means to still something, to shout, to address in a loud tone. And so that is, it is the power of the voice and praise that will raise everybody up into heaven once they are raised on their, onto their feet in their earthly bodies. And remember, I said the woman is taken up by eagle's wings. The cords of the righteous, Psalm 68. Though ye have lean among the pots, ye shall be as the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold when the mighty, the almighty scattered kings in it. It was white as snow in Salmon. So this is the angelic forms that we're talking about. One of the things I mentioned about the specialness of the 144,000 is that the 144,000 will rule in the upper heaven and the lower. They will have, it seems like they're going to be in both places. I could be wrong about that. So if anyone has more evidence or thoughts on this, let me know. But why do they rule in both places? Because Israel is the firstborn son, and the firstborn son has specific rights, as I always talk about. So, they, so Israel will rule twice. We'll have two 1,000-year reigns. They had their one around the time of Dawid and the judges and, and Solomon, etc. And But this will be the perfect 1,000-year reign. So they will have had 2,000-year reigns. And the law says in Deuteronomy 21, 17, but he shall acknowledge the firstborn son of the unloved by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the first fruits of his strength. So Israel is the first fruits. And even though Israel was unloved because Yah chose a second wife in the Gentiles, the firstborn son still gets the double blessing. And of course, Machpelah means return again. And so we talked about the four squared, it shall be doubled. And so there is going to be an upper and lower heaven. And so the 144 will reign, I believe, in both places. We'll go between the two places. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice from many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with harps. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So this is all the way up in heaven before the throne of the Yahuwah. Now here's references to the chords that will be used by the 144 to secure heaven and earth. Okay, this is the work that Yahusha is carving out, has carved out already, and this is the co-work they are doing with Yahusha. And everyone who dies and raise, is raised again in heaven is also doing. 
So Enoch says, and I saw in those days how long cords were given to those angels and they took to themselves wings and flew and they went towards the north. And I asked the angel saying unto him, why have those cords, those angels taken those cords and gone off? And he said to me, they have gone to measure. So remember I said, family, we're being measured right now. We're being measured. And the angel who went with me said unto me, these shall bring the measures of the righteous and the ropes of the righteous to the righteous, that they may stay themselves on the name of Yahuwah of spirits forever and ever. And the elect shall begin to dwell with the elect. So this is, the, this is the beginning, the one four four and the two candlesticks the, and the, the one third remnant all together. Now Hosea says, and I drew them with the cords of man with bands of love. And I was to them as they that take the yoke off their jaws and I laid meat unto them. So in other translation, it says, I drew them with cords of kindness. So Yah's kindness leads to our repentance. And of course, the tabernacle is built with cords. We have all of these examples. So even look up Isaiah 33 and 20. Look upon Zion, the city of solemnities. Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed. Neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. The altar has cords around about it. And Yah even laments in Jeremiah, there is none to stretch forth my tent anymore to set up my curtains. So the cords of his tent. Lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. Okay? He's talking about enlarging the cords of your tent. So they're cords of kindness and love, but Yahuwah also binds the sacrifice with cords. And so this is the correlation to the 144 who sing with the harps. And Yah says, to him that overcometh, he will make a pillar in the temple of Elohim and write upon the, him the name of Elohim and the name of the city of Elohim. So they are constructing through their righteousness and through a, being a sacrifice on the altar and through the shout and song of praise and the, the harps, they become the city. The people are the city, which is new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from Elohim. How do we know they will bring themselves as an offering to the mountain? Also the sons of the foreigner that join themselves to Yahuwah to serve him and to love the name of Yahuwah, to be his servants and everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and take hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain, and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. So family, there are subtle nuances and differences between Eden, all right, which is in the third heaven, probably equal to the mount versus the 10th heaven. And so these are distinctions we have to make when the people go up the mount versus when people go up into the upper heaven. Let's hear what Enoch has to say. He says, and then those men took me from there and brought me up to the third heaven and set me down there. And I looked downward and I saw paradise. And that place is inconceivably pleasant. And I saw the trees in full flower. So paradise is in the third heaven. Okay, so Eden, Mount Sinai, or what is above Mount Sinai, or the seven mountains, that is in the third heaven. Okay, then here's his vision of the tenth heaven. So it seems like the third heaven has degrees. So it, it's got like maybe, I guess, eight more levels to it. Okay, because it's the third heaven. So there's two below. That's the firmament and the, the heavens where the birds are. The, the firmament and, you know, where the sun and moon and stars are. The heavens where the birds are. There's the heaven where Yah is and where Eden is part of. And then there's this tenth heaven. So it says the tenth heaven. And the vision 
was shown to me thus. Behold, in the vision, clouds invited me, and a mist summoned me, and the course of the stars and the lightning sped and hastened me. And the winds in the vision caused me to fly and lifted me upward and bore me into heaven. And I went in till I drew nigh to a wall which is built of crystals and surrounded by tongues of fire, and it began to affright me. So beautiful. I went into the tongues of fire and drew nigh to a large house, which was built of crystals, and the walls of the house were like tessellated floor made of crystals, and its groundwork, and its ceiling was like a path of the stars, and the lightnings, and between them were fiery cherubim, and their heaven was clear as water. A flaming fire surrounded the walls, and its portals blazed with fire. And I entered into that house, and it was as hot as fire and as cold as ice. All right, family. So this gets very descriptive, but nonetheless, Enoch gets to enter the highest height of the 10th heaven where Yahuwah is. And he literally is on his face. He can't even get up because the glory is so overwhelming. It's almost killing him. Uh, he's in a state of dread and awe all at the same time. So no, none of the angels or any flesh could behold him because of his, the power of his glory destroying them. The flaming fire was round about him, and a great fire stood before him, and none around could draw nigh him. And I had been prostrate on my face, trembling, and Yahuwah called me with his own mouth, right? And said to me, come hither, Enoch, and hear my word. We're going to continue on to this, this other verse here where it says, uh, no man can see Yahuwah and leave. On the tenth heaven, Arabath, I saw the appearance of Yahuwah's face like iron made to glow in fire and brought out emitting sparks and it burns. Thus I saw Yahuwah's face, but Yahuwah's face is ineffable, marvelous, and very awful and very, very terrible. And who am I to tell of Yahuwah's unspeakable being and of his very wonderful face? And I cannot tell the quantity of his many instructions and various voices. Yahuwah's throne very great and not made with hands nor the quantity of those standing around him troops of cherubim and seraphim nor their incessant singing nor his immutable beauty and who shall tell of the ineffable greatness of his glory so you, you, you see how he's calling it terrible at the same time beautiful and um their singing is incessant like he's like it, it seems he's very overwhelmed by the power of everything and probably the period purity of it all just being a man from earth right and i fell prone and bowed down to yahuwah and yahuwah with his lips said to me have courage enoch do not fear arise and stand before my face into eternity and the archestrad michael lifted me up and led me before yahuwah's face and yahuwah said to his servants tempting them let enoch stand before my face into eternity and the glorious ones bowed down to yahuwah and said let Enoch go according to thy word. And Yahuwah said to Michael, Go and take you Enoch from out his earthly garments and anoint him with my sweet ointment and put him into the garments of my glory. Family, so now we've got some context about the sacrifice, the pillars and the cords that will be used as Israel goes up, the 144 to assemble the temple with a shout with praise, with sound, which transforms everything and wins the battle, wins the victory. Let's get into, once again, the crossing over and the 144 going up. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon was under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child and cried, travailing in birth, and was pained ready to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, for behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, to devour her child, when she had brought it forth. So she brought forth a man-child, which should rule all nations with a rod of iron. Family, I really have to correct myself. I'm about to make a whole new turn. 
because of, yeah, I had to check my heart and correct me on some stuff. And I was so much guarding the Church of Philadelphia and their rise. Why? Because doctrine I've been taught one of my Hebrew, by one of my Hebrew children. And this will seem so obvious to everybody. And I used to believe what I'm about to teach before, but I changed my I'm going to give you this correction, which that Aya gave me, and he did it very kindly. He just showed me you some things, but I am going to ask you, especially you Hebrew Israelites who regularly follow this channel, stay close, stay in the lesson because I'm about to take a sharp right turn. We know that Jeremiah 11 and 16 says, Yahuwah has called the a green olive tree. This is what he says of Judah and Israel, or Judah and Joseph. The branches thereof are broken off because the olive trees, olive trees very clearly are Israel, the northern and southern kingdom. All right. And very often as well, they are Levi and Judah. I had somebody interrupting the, the lesson with, it says two sticks and other people saying, we've heard this before, but family, please be patient with me. We have to teach this to those newcomers and I just have to reinforce it over and over again. Zechariah 4, chapters 3 and 4 are also important in Zechariah. We're going to go through Revelation and the churches. And the angel that talked with me came to me again and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it upon the right side of the bowl and upon the left side. This is the word of Yahuwah unto Zerubbabel. And now Zerubbabel means sown in Babylon, right? Saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yahuwah of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also shall finish it. And thou shalt know that Yahuwah of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and they shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven lampstands. They are the eyes of Yahuwah, which run to and thro throughout the whole earth. And I answered and said unto him, What are the two olive trees on the right side of the candlestick and on the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, And what be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves. And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Yahuwah. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones, the olive branches, that stand by Yahuwah of the whole earth. So now remember in Zechariah chapter 3, we had an angel standing before Yahusha, the high priest who was in captivity to Babylon saying in Zechariah 3, and he showed me Yahusha the high priest standing before the high priest, and the angel of Yahuwah says, I will cause iniquity to pass from thee and clothe thee with a changing raiment. Right? And so that was a callback to what we saw in the last lesson, family. And in that lesson, we saw Zerubbabel, Yahusha the high priest, and Zerubbabel. And this is when the angel of Yahuwah clothed, brought Yahusha the high priest out of the fire of affliction of Babylon and clothed him in righteousness. All right. And Zerubbabel, the two of them would rebuild the second temple with Nehemiah and Ezra and all, and of course, with by the, with the finances of Cyrus, all right, who would build the second temple, and this is very important to this study. So now we're going to talk about the two candlesticks, Revelation 1, 1, and 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of Yahuwah and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city 
shall they tread underfoot for forty and two months, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand and two hundred and three score days in clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before Yahuwah Elohim of the earth. And if any man hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Okay, and so we're going to talk about who the two candlesticks are. And in my last study, I probably said that they were the six churches, and that is my error. Everybody knows, and it's painfully obvious, that it is the Church of Philadelphia, and it is the Church of Smyrna. And we're going to get into why one of those churches is partially a Gentile church. All right, so let's get into the two candlesticks. Amen. Because what do you see here when you read this family? It says, I will give power to my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand and two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before Elohim of the earth. So both of these two witnesses, the two candlesticks and the two olive trees will prophesy before Yahuwah of the whole earth. And if any man kill both of these sets, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So both these two church assemblies, who are the candlesticks, and the 144,000, who are the two olive trees, will have these same powers. And we'll all have to die and be raised again. And it will be dying and raising again, just like Lazarus. So being raised into your human status. And then they will go up to heaven. Family, we're going to learn that there is a great distinction between the 144 and the two candlesticks. So the two candlesticks are the Church of Philadelphia, the one-third remnant, and Smyrna. All right? But the 144 have a special double blessing. So they will be caught up to the third and potentially tenth heaven. Whereas the one-third remnant in Smyrna will be caught up to the third heaven or the heaven that is on the mountain. Which I just described at the very beginning. And this is the distinction. This is not rapture. Why? Because the one-third remnant, who are the Church of Philadelphia and the Gentile mix, Smyrna, will be caught up to the mountain, whereas the 144 will be caught up to the high heaven. But before that happens, they're raised back into life in their human body and caught up. And I believe they are raised back to life potentially in their Adamic form. Their Adamic form. Or they could simply just be raised back to life in their human form. I'm talking about the two candlesticks, the one-third remnant and Smyrna. And the Gentiles could even be included in that. All right, the, the Gentiles called by Yah's name. So this is like even the Church of Thyatira, which is a little special in and of itself. But nonetheless, people are raised back to life in human form. Then they go up. But I do believe the 144 are transformed into a human angel army. And so I'm going to pose these questions to you as to what's been revealed to me. And I want to get your answers. So we're going to go into that. And so I'm going to explain what happens to the other five Gentile churches and who they are, family. So let's get into it. And so, of course, you know, these are the, this is the letter to the seven churches that are in Asia. Amen. So grace and peace do to be to you who was and is and is to come from the seven spirits who were before his throne. 
skipping uh, over, saying I'm the Aleph and the Ta, the first and the last. So we're in the time of what? The Aleph and the Ta, the end sign of the Ta, the first and the last, the eclipse. Write in a book and send it to the seven churches that are in Yesaya, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, Laodicea. Then I turned back to see the voice that spake with me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed in a garment down to the feet, and girded about the paps with a golden girdle, and on his head and hairs were white as wool and as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire, and his feet like unto burnished brass. So we know who that is, Yahusha. So let we're about to take a look at the seven two candlesticks who are also the general assembly and church of the firstborn written in heaven. And they are caught up with the one four four firstborn. And they do all of these miracles, have fire coming out of their mouth, and they that one four four and the two candlesticks both die and are raised up. Who are the two candlesticks amongst these seven churches? First, we're going to look at the Church of Philadelphia. Now, this is in chapter 3, but the Church of Philadelphia is the most important church, and it's the church I got hung up on due to my own biases, which I have to repent of, and so I'm doing it in front of your face. Revelation 3 and 9. All right, this is the Church of Philadelphia. Let him that hath an ear hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Write unto ye the angel of ye church, which is of Philadelphia. These things saith he that is holy and true, which has ye key of David, which openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Now, I have always said that this includes... This is the Church of Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. So this is the northern and the southern kingdom. This is the 12 brothers who are brothers who are in love, all right, operating in love. Now you're going to see this is going to, I'm going to take you to a hard twist, but in, in the spirit, I was always saying this is Israel and Judah and their companions, whatever friends come with them and companions and brothers come with them. Gentiles come with them at the time. Gentiles called by the name of Yahuwah. So we're going to see an interesting correlation to this scripture. I know thy works. By Behold, I have set before thee an open door no man can shut. For thou hast little strength and hast kept my word and not denied my name. Now this name is very important. This name is Yahuwah and Yahusha. This is the name. Please watch my little Jules Torah studies, and I go into the name of Yah. Very important to have the name, because the Church of Philadelphia, which has no error in perfect in Yahuwah's sight, has the true Hebrew name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which call themselves Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I say, I will make them that they shall come and worship before thy feet, and shall know that I have loved thee. So this is true Israel because the fake Israel is going to have to bow at their feet. And there's only one other church that is mentioned in connection with the synagogue of Satan. So what is being set up here is a contrast between the true, true 12 tribes of Israel versus people who are misrepresenting themselves as true Israel. This is one of the distinguishing factors that clearly tells us this, in fact, is Israel. This is a very curious statement here. Saith he that is holy and true, which has the key of David, which openeth no, and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. And then it says, I have set before thee an open door, which no man can shut it. This is very important. Why? Because at this time, when the two olive trees and the two candlesticks die, stand on their feet, raised up in human form like Lazarus, when they ascend up and are transformed, that is when the door to heaven is opened. 
and no man can shut it and shut and no man can open it. When they're calling fire down from heaven and they withhold the rain from heaven, they are opening and shutting the doors of heaven. All right. Remember, I will, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. Revelation 22 and 12 says, 12 gates at the gates, 12 angels, and the names were written, which are the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. The 12 doors of the kingdom of heaven are of the 12 tribes, and they are the doormen who can open and no man can shut it and shutteth, and no man can open. So they're, at this time, they're going to open room 101, the door to heaven. That's why it's two sticks, because that is like two pillars on a door. All right? And where do we see this scripture? Well, we see this in Eliakim, king of Judah. And Jerusalem, who was renamed Jehoiakim. Yehoi he was one of the sons of the Yehudi kings who was taken captive, and the son was Jehoiakim was raised up. And so his name means Yehoah raises up to reestablish the king kingdom again after a captivity. And this is the same word that is like used with ensign. I will set up an ensign to all nations. And now we know this big X eclipse is like an end sign. That is the Aleph. That's the Ta is an end sign signifying 400 years or over. Please go watch my video on that. But it means whom Yahuwah has set up. And here's a prophecy to him. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hiliakah. And I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit my government to his hand and he shall be father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to the house of Yehuda, And the keys of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulders, so he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail. Who, got, who was fastened with a nail in the arms? Yeh Yehusha. In a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne, to his father's house. So this is the establishing of the throne of Yahusha, and by extension Yahuwah, right? And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring, the issue, and all vessels of small quantity from vessels of cups, even to all the vessels of flagons. So these are the, the vessels, golden vessels of service in the kingdom. Now, family, I'm going to take you to another scripture, and you guys are all going to take a harsh right turn. Now, we're talking about the two candlesticks and the two witnesses, the 144. So we're going to find out who else, who else doors are open to by Yahusha. Yahusha unseals the doors. Yahusha opens the doors and the windows of heaven when the offering is brought into the storehouse. Because remember... These are sacrifices we talked about on the altar that is prepared. They are a sacrifice on the lintel. And so who else are these gates and doors open to? Thus saith Yahuwah to his anointed one, to Cyrus, whose right hand have I holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of king to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. And he also in this prophecy says, and he will, he will be given the treasures of darkness. So what the various Cyruses of the Medo-Persian Empire did was they opened the gates of Babylon and they were able to get Israel, which is the greatest treasure on earth, as well as to get back all of the treasures that were in the temple. But not only that, Cyrus, who became the offspring, watch my Esther video for more details, the offspring of Esther, her son, who was an Israelite, he was the one who paid to rebuild the second temple. They have something to do with Israel coming out of Babylon, just as they did what has happened before will happen again. Yah says a thing once. And no Persians, so-called Iranians, Arshish, Tarkish, 
ships of Tarshish, Caspian Sea, Turkey. So Iran of today is part of the Medo-Persian Empire. Of course, Medai is the son of Japheth, who makes up the Medo-Persian Empire and has always dwelt with the Shemitic people and married Shemitic women. They will return as they did in the past, the scepter to the kingdom as well as the bride back to the kingdom. And that is their role. And they have the power to loose the loins of kings and to open before him the two-leaved gates and the gates shall not be shut. The Church of Philadelphia. What does Yahuwah say about them? They are perfect in his eyes. eyes. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, therefore I will deliver thee from the hour of temptation which will come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So the hour of temptation, other translations say the great tribulation. I, this may be Geneva, a great tribulation. Hold, I come shortly. Hold that which thou hast, that no man may take thy what crown. So this is the king and the priest, right? In Deuteronomy, Yah said, you will become a kingdom of priests. So no one will take their crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of Elohim, and he shall go no more out. So we know once again, Boaz and Jason are the two pillars. I have them on the gates here, but they were the pillars in the temple of Solomon. All right. So again, we see very clearly it is Israel who are the olive trees. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. Now we're going to skip ahead into Revelation 14 and 3. Because what I want you to, to see here is that it says, and 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. So Yahuwah, same thing as here. And I will write upon him the name of Elohim, and the name of the city of my Elohim, which is New Jerusalem, which is also just Salem. So I'll write peace on your forehead, which cometh down out of heaven from Elohim. And I will write upon him my new name. So there are three names because, you know, the city is actually made of Israel. It's made of the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles and the 144. All right. And clearly, the Church of Philadelphia. And so these three names are written on their foreheads. So let's continue on. Assembly of the Firstborn. And this ties, of course, into Ezekiel. Because we're dealing with the two sticks. So Ezekiel, when Yah says to prophesy to the dry bones and cause them to live, he does prophesy skin comes onto the bones. So it says, and when I looked and lo, sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy son of man and say to the wind, thus saith Yahuwah, Yah, come from the four winds, O breath, O breath upon and breathe upon these slain. Sorry for that fam that they might, this is the breath of life of the Ruach HaKodesh coming into Israel because they stand up. This is the birth, the spirit of the breath, right? Comes into them and they stand up again. They're resurrected after they are destroyed by the beast, okay? And I prophesied as he commanded to me and breath came into them and they lived and sweat, stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are what? The whole house of who? Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, behold, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to what? Come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. So this is a larger prophecy for coming out of the Egypt of the whole earth and in particular Egypt, America. But it's also for the resurrection of the two witnesses and the two candlesticks who stand up on their feet, right? And they have gone down to three days of darkness, three days of death in the belly of the beast, just like Jonah and Yahusha. 
And the word of Yahuwah came again to me, saying, Moreover, son of man, take a piece of wood and write upon it unto Judah and to the children of Israel, his companions, and to take another piece of wood and write upon it unto Joseph, the tree of Ephraim, and to all the house of Israel, his companions. And thou shalt join one to another in one tree, like the Ta, right? The Tav. And they shall be as one in thine hand. So the two sticks become one. People are like, it says two witnesses. Here's your two sticks. There's two candlesticks and there's two trees that are two sticks. And these two sticks are the whole house of Israel. Skipping down to verse 20. And the pieces of wood whereon thou writest shall be in thy hand in their, their sight. And say to them, thus saith Yahuwah, Yahuwah, behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one people upon the mountains of Israel. This is very important to the cloud thing, okay? And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall no more be two peoples, neither divided any more, henceforth into two kingdoms. So that's why they were two sticks, two trees. Now they will become one. How are they united? In Yahusha, who's the central light. And that's what unites them all into one tree. He is the tree of life. Emily, watch my video on the tree. Israel is a great tree. Maya reiterates that in, the, in those days, Judah shall come together to the house of Israel and they shall come together from the land of the north and from all countries to the land which I cause their fathers to inherit. I will set thee among children and will give thee a choice land, the inheritance of the almighty Alua of the Gentiles. So he's, re he's reminding them, I'm also the Elohim of the Gentiles. So when people say Elohim is not an Elohim of the Gentiles, he calls himself the Elohim of the Gentiles. And who has the land? The Gentiles. All right, so whose scepter is being returned? Israel's. But it's also the Gentiles called by Yah's name who are returning to the land. And I said, ye shall call me father and ye shall not turn away from me. So this is the prophecy of in that day when I said, uh, where where I am going to say, you are my sons again, you are Israel. All right, so let's go into these churches. Now, the church, I'm going to, in no specific order, really go into these four churches because we're going to figure out exactly who the two sticks are. And so the message to Ephesus is Revelation 2 and 2, I know thy works and thy labor that the, the, and thy patience how thou cannot bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. So skipping down all the way down to verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Now, a lot of people think this is Yahushua, but this is actually Israel, because when you look at first love in the Hebrew the word first is before, and, and in most instances, when you look up that word, it's messenger that goes before the gospel. So the messengers of the gospel. So that's Israel. That's why Yahushua said, I have come but for the lost sheep of Israel, because in Romans, unto them belongeth the adoption, the covenants, the giving of the law, etc. They are the ones who give the good news to the nations. All right? And so this church has forgotten who or is resisting who true Israel is. Obviously, they're, they're saved and going to be saved because they know Yahusha. And it's Yahusha who's talking to them. So he's not saying, you've forgotten me, which is what the church teaches. They are saying their first love because who gives them the gospel? How will they know unless someone preaches? And so the, the witnesses, the two witnesses, they're Israel sent out in two to preach to them. So this is their problem. And so they were rejecting who Israel, true Israel is, or they've forgotten. Whatever the case is, this is what he has against them. And he says, therefore, remember, therefore, from whence you art fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will what? 
remove your candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So they're in danger of having their actual candlestick removed. So this is not one of the churches. But the promise is, he who has an ear, let him hear. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Elohim. So we know this church can possibly live. In the thousand year reign, there is still a heaven above because the church has to descend at the end of Revelation. The heaven above connects with the base, the kingdom and temple carved out by Yahusha on earth that he reigns from for a thousand years. Then the actual upper part of the temple descends from heaven and connects with it. And so there, there's an upper and lower level to the kingdom of heaven during the thousand year reign. In Revelation 2 and 4, we have Pergamos. And it says, I have this against thee. Thou hast there them that maintain the doctrine of Balaam, which taught the lack to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, that they should eat of things sacrificed to idols and commit fornication. So these have been involved with causing Israel to sin and probably themselves sinning by eating food sacrificed to idols and committing fornication. But the promise that is made to them, and this is the um, church in Pergamos, which is uh, where Satan dwells, so probably around Germany or Turkey, okay, which is still part of the land, northern kingdom of Israel. Let him that have an ear hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the manna that is hid, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving that he, he that receiveth it. All right, so that's the reward they can get. Now with Sardis, it says, I know thy works, for thou hast a name that thou livest and thou art dead. So these guys are spiritually dead. And says, but notwithstanding, thou hast a few names yet in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And he that overcometh shall be clothed in white array, and I will not put his name out of the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So these guys are in danger of having their names put blotted out of the book of life. So this is not the church. And then last, Laodicea, I know thy works that thou art neither hot or cold, and I would that thou wouldest cold or hot, for I'm about to spit you out of my mouth, because you say you are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and sit with my father in his throne. So this is in the heavens. This is the upper heaven, the throne where the throne of Yah is, where Yahusha sits on the throne. And so these will sit in the throne with him. And the upper heaven is where people have been resurrected from death. They haven't been resurrected from death back to life on the earth like Lazarus, they've died and resurrected up into the upper heaven. Now we also have Thyatira, and Thyatira is kind of a mixed church as well. It says, I have a few things against thee. So they tolerate this prophetess who is a Jezebel who lets people commit fornication and eat meat sacrifice to idols again. All right. Now we go down to Revelation 226 he that overcometh and keep in my works to unto the end him I will give power over the nations now he's there's sort of half of this church is okay as with Sardis okay and it says that those who overcome he will give this is the key phrase he, he that overcometh and keep my works unto the end. This ties in with those who are alive and remain will be caught up in the cloud by keeping his works to the end. To him I will give power over the nations 
and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and as vessels as a potter shall they be broken. Even if I as I received to my father, so will I give him the morning star. So Thyatira is somewhat pleasing to Yahuwah. But they're not perfect because of this Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives servants into committing fornication and eating meat sacrificed to idols. All right. But they're somewhat pleasing to him and they will be in the kingdom if they are alive and remain. And it seems like there will be among those who are alive and remain and get caught up in the cloud. Now, everybody knows Smyrna. Smirnoff is actually the church of Samaria. And Samaria was actually part of the northern kingdom. All right. So it is the Hellenized name from the Hebrew room name Shamaron. Shamaron. The historical biblical name for the central region of Israel bordered by Judea to the south of Galilee. It's important to understand who the Smyrnatans are, the Samaritans, because these, these are Assyrians, they're Midianites, both of Keturah and Abraham and the Medo-Persians of Cyrus. They are from the land of Ephraim and Manasseh. At, after the building of the second temple, uh, Manasseh returned to the building of the second temple but he was kicked out because he had a Gentile wife. And so he went back to his land, to this region. And so the scripture says, Ephraim is a cake unturned. In other words, Joseph and some of these other 10 tribes would mix very much in with the Gentiles. And this is why when Yahushua goes to see the Samaritan woman, she says, oh, the Jews won't talk to us because they think we're unclean. We still worship Yahuwah on the mountain. So these are the Samaritans. People say Yahuwah never dealt with the Gentiles because he very clearly has. <laughs> he just called himself the Elohim of the Gentiles over here. Okay, so he dealt with the Gentiles. And unto the angel of the church of the Samaritans write these things. He that is first and is last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and thy tribulation and poverty. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So it's the same as the church of Philadelphia. So there's some way in which these people are genetically of the bloodline of Israel. Because again, somebody is taken their identity. So they're somehow mixed in, which we know Ephraim and Manasseh are, are mixed in with the other nations. In Revelation 2.10, Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, it shall come to pass. The devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be trial, tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thy, thou faithful unto death here, and I will give thee a crown of life. So these people are going to die unto death, yet they will get a crown of life. All right. So to me, this ties in, and I'm sure many already know this, and this is what I actually used to believe before. Okay. So we can all be, including myself, affected by doctrine, because I believed it was always Philadelphia and Smyrna, but I changed my mind for a long season. So here I am back to this again. So in my view, I believe they're one of the two candlesticks. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of what? The second death. All right? So they'll be raised up and they won't be hurt of the second death. Oh, Jeremiah 3 and 18 says, In those days the house of Yehuda will come together with the house of Israel. These are the two sticks and the two witnesses. And they shall come together from the land of the north and from all countries to the land which I caused their fathers to inherit. And I said, so be it, Yahuwah, for thou saidest, I will set thee among the children and I will give thee a choice land, the inheritance of the almighty Elua of the Gentiles. And I said, you shall call me father and you shall not turn away from me. So what is he called here, family? Almighty Elua of the Gentiles. Why? because they're returning to their land and the Gentiles have it. But as a wife acts treacherously against her husband, so has the house of Israel dealt treacherously against me, saith Yahuwah. 
So this corresponds with the time that Yahuwah formally really brought in the Gentiles after the Babylonian captivity. And this, this we're catching up in the same place, thus saith Yahuwah Almighty, here in Ez, 2 Ezra 1. Your house is desolate, and I will cast you out as the wind to stubble, and your children shall not be fruitful, for they have despised my commandment and done the thing that is an evil before me. So your houses will I give to a people that shall come, which have not heard of me yet, shall believe me, to whom I have showed no signs, yet they shall do that I have commanded them. They have seen no prophets, yet they shall call their sins to remembrance and acknowledge them. I take witness to the grace of the people to come, whose little ones rejoice in gladness, though they have not seen me with bodily eyes, yet in spirit they believe the thing that I say. Now, brother, behold, what glory, and see the people that come from the east. Now, we know the Medo-Persians are in the east, all right? Unto whom I will give for leaders, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and of course, all of these leaders. So this is the prophecy in, during the Babylonian captivity that Yah will give all of Israel's land to other nations, to the Gentiles, and begin to deal with them. This is the promise given to the house of Jethro, the Rechabite, in Jeremiah 35. And so if you'll remember, Jethro was the father-in-law of Moses, the father of Zephora, the wife of Moses. And they were descendants of Midian, who was one of the sons of Abraham and Keturah, Abraham's second wife, who was a Cushite. He says, go unto the house of the Rechabites and speak unto them and bring them into the house of Yahuwah Elohim into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. And I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wine and cups and said unto them, drink wine. <clears throat> but they said, we will drink no wine for Ayanadab, the son of Rechab, our father commanded us saying, we shall drink no wine, neither you nor your sons forever, neither shall ye build house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any, but all your days ye shall dwell in tents that ye may live a long time in the land where ye be strangers. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Ayanadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he charged us. And we drink no wine in all our days, neither we, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters, neither build we houses, for us to dwell in, neither have we vineyard, nor field, nor seed, but we have remained in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Ayanadab, our father, commanded us. And so we skip to verse 6. When Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babel, came up against the land, we said, Come and let us go to Jerusalem from the house of the Chaldeans and from the host of Aram. And we dwelt at Jerusalem. Then came the word of Yahuwah to Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith Yahuwah of hosts, of the Elohim of Israel, go and tell the men of Yehuda, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, will ye not receive doctrine to obey my words, saith Yahuwah? The commandment of Ayanadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons that they should drink no wine is surely kept, for unto this day they drink none but obey their father's commandment, notwithstanding I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but you would not obey me, and to your fathers, but you would not incline your ear, nor obey me. Surely the sons of Ayanadab, the son of Rechab, have kept the commandment of their father, which he gave them, but this people hath not obeyed me. Therefore thus saith Yahuwah of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, behold, I will bring upon Yehuda and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken unto them, but they would not hear, and I have called unto them, but they would not answer. And Jeremiah said to the house of the Rechabites, Thus saith Yahuwah of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, because you have obeyed the commands of Ayanadab your father, and kept all his precepts, and done according to all that he hath commanded you. Therefore, thus saith Yahuwah of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, Ayanadab, the son of Rechab, will not want a man 
to stand before me forever. This means that he served Yahuwah, that he would serve Yahuwah. How do we know that? Because Jethro was a man of Yahuwah who served Yahuwah as a priest. And he helped return Moses to the priesthood. And so it was all the way back at the time of Jethro that these same people were serving Yahuwah. A little bit more information on them. Who These were the descendants of Habab or Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses in Jeremiah. Yohanadab, who is their father, who, we've, who made them make this vow, at an earlier point in the Bible, according to the Jewish Encyclopedia, was a companion of King Japh, who, when he slaughtered the prophets of Baal. And Yohanadab was apparently a champion of the worship of Yahuwah against the, that of Baal. And it is stated that a certain people of Jabez in Judah were the Kenites that came of Hamath, the father of the house of Rechab. They resisted the customs of the people in the world and remained nomads and strangers in the midst of Israel. And it was the appointed time for the service of the Rechabites in the temple was the seventh of Ab. After the destruction of the, seventh, the second temple, traces of the Rechabites. We know Jethro served Yahuwah. He was a priest of Midian. When Yahuwah says these will be before him, they will continue to be before Yahuwah, serving him forever. So these are Gentiles because they're not Israel. They're descendants of Abraham, but they're not Israel. Because we're going to give the example of the church of Smyrna, we have to look at the Samaritan. Yahusha sends out the apostles in 70s. He tells them only to go to the lost sheep of Israel, but not to the Gentiles. And then he says, nor the Samaritans. So there's a difference between Gentiles and Samaritans, but they're not Israel. When we're talking about the Samaritans, we are talking about the Midianites of Keturah and Abraham. We're also talking about Midianites of Madai and his Shemitic wife and Cyrus and Esther, the Medo-Persians. Okay, those are the grafted in of Japheth and the grafted in of Ham. And then we are talking about whoever Ephraim and Manasseh mixed with, because there was actually a priest named Manasseh who returned to build the second temple, but he was rejected because he had a wife of the nations. Okay, so he was rejected by Nehemiah to build the temple. Nonetheless, who paid to build the temple? Cyrus who was a descendant of Japheth. Luke 10 is talking about the good Samaritan. A certain lawyer stands up and asks Yahusha how she, he should inherit eternal life. And Yahusha basically says, love the Lord your Elohim with all your heart, soul, and strength, and all thy mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so then the lawyer says, well, who is my neighbor? And so Yahusha says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And so various people come by, nobody helps him, not the priest, not the Levite, only the Samaritan. The certain Samaritan, as he journeyed and comes near unto him, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds and poured oil and wine on him and put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn, and made provision for him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two more pence, and gave them to the host, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will recompense thee. So Yahushua says, Which now of these thinkest thou was a neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And the rich man says, He that showed mercy on him. Then Yahushua said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. So this is how you know the child of Yahuwah. And this is the conduct of the Samaritans. Samaritans, or Samaria, is in the land of Ephraim and Manasseh. And what is said of Ephraim is that they really mixed him with strangers. And so it says they were as hot as an oven 
and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth to me. Ephraim hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is as a cake on the hearth not turned. So when you turn a cake, you brown it, right? Brown it on one side, you brown it on the other side. So now he's mixed in with the, the other nations. Strangers have devoured his strength. Okay, so his seed has been weakened by mixing with strangers. And he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. Now also, the wives of Isaac and Jacob, Rebekah and Rachel, you know, were Shemitic women. And they both drew water out of a well. And this was the test to see if they were, would be a good wife, a good woman. Actually, Zephora too. For Moses. So now Yahusha himself sits at the side of the well and asks for a drink of water from the Samaritan woman, just like Elijah asked of Rebecca to prove who she was and if she was a good woman, and just as was done for Jacob. They come to the city of Samaria called Sychar, near unto the possession that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And there was Jacob's well, and Yahusha, wearied in the journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Yahusha said, give me to drink. And she says later on, as we go all the way to verse 20, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Yahusha says unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem, worship the Father. Ye worship that which ye know yet not. We worship that which we know, for salvation is of the Yahudin. So he is the Savior coming out of the line of David, and he's telling her as a Samaritan woman, a descendant of the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, who's mixed in with the other nations, that salvation has come. And so all these Samaritans believe in him and believe on him. And they said unto the woman, now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this indeed is Mashiach, the savior of the world. And so this is the picture of the male and female Samaritan. And so we know their, their lineage, they're mixed with other nations but they are of Ephraim and Manasseh. But more to that, we see the Samaritans are actually, this is a place where the Persians ruled. So the Medo-Persians were there and other nations. The people of Samaria regarded, were regarded as the remnant of Israel as when Josiah suppressed the high places among them and collected money to repair the house of Yahuwah from Manasseh and Ephraim and all the remnant of Israel. So basically they were rebuilding the second temple and they co collected money from Manasseh and Ephraim for the rebuilding of the second temple. And a priest of Manasseh did come in the time of Jer Jeremiah desiring to join in the offerings at the temple. Later on, this claim to participation in the building of the temple was rejected by Zerubbabel on the grounds that he was of mixed origin. Now, in truth, he had married a woman. The condition of things at Jerusalem, the facts are as follows. The governor of Samaria under Darius, so this is the descendant of Esther, was Salambat, whose daughter was married to Manasseh, the son of the high priest at Jerusalem. She is a descendant of of the Medo-Persians, all right? And the Medo-Persians were ruling there. And in consequence of this foreign marriage, Manasseh was expelled by Nehemiah and was invited by his father-in-law to settle in Samaria. And this is why we call back to Cyrus the Great, who was a descendant of Esther, the son of Esther. When they, the elders of Judah builded the temple, this is what is said. And the house was finished in the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And we read all the way in Isaiah 45, this is what Yahuwah says about Cyrus. 
Thus saith Yahuwah to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue the nations before him, I will loose the loins of king to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. They just as it says in the Church of Philadelphia, the two leaved gates. I will go before you and make the crooked, crooked places straight. I will give you treasures of darkness and hidden riches of the secret places, that you may know I, Yahuwah, who call you by your name, the Gentiles call by Yahuwah's name now, but I call you by your name, I am the Elohim of Israel, for Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel my elect. I have even called you by your name, I have named you, though you have not known me. I am Yahuwah, and there is no other, there is no Elohim besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am Elua, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, Yahuwah, do all these things. Ye heavens, send dew from heaven above, and let the clouds drop down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let salvation and justice grow forth. Let it bring them forth together. I, Yahuwah, have created him. We have the rain, we have the earth opening, and then justice growing forth together. So this is their resurrection also. This is a prophecy actually of Mashiach, but it parallels with Cyrus, who is of the seed of Japheth. So we can't say that Yahuwah didn't deal with the Gentiles. Why in particular? because it is the Iranians who are prophesied to come against Babylon as it was in the beginning, so it shall be in the end, to destroy Babylon in this time right now. The burden of Babel, which I, Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see, lift up a standard among the high mountain, lift up the voice of them to wag the hand that they may go into the what? Gates of the nobles. I have commanded them that I have sanctified and I have called the mighty to my wrath and them that rejoice in my glory. The noise of a multitude is in the mountains like a great people, a tumultuous voice of the kingdoms of the nations gathered together. The Yahuwah of hosts numbered, numbereth the hosts of battle. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them which shall not regard silver nor be desirous of gold. With bows also shall they destroy the children and shall have no compassion upon the fruit of the womb and their eyes shall not spare the children. And Babel, the glory of the kingdom, the beauty of the pride of the Chaldeans shall be as the destruction of Elohim in Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is when it talks about, and the people, the Gentiles shall take them and bring them to their place. So very clearly we can look at this because we see that the two candlesticks, but after three days and a half, the spirit of life, remember what I showed you with Ezekiel. And so I prophesied and he commanded me and the breath of life came into them and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. Who's Yahushua coming on the clouds with an exceeding great army? But after three days and a half, the spirit of life coming from Elohim shall enter into them and they shall stand upon their feet and great fear shall come upon them which saw them and they that shall hear a great voice from heaven saying unto them come up hither and they shall ascend up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies shall see them all right so i believe it's three and a half days it is actually three and a half days because their enemies have to witness them. They get half a day to see them. Here are the two candlesticks, Philadelphia and Smyrna. Master of the obvious, that's me. <laughs> All right, family. <laughs> now, family, my question to you here is, when the 144,000 and the one-third and two candlesticks rise to their feet, Will they rise like Lazarus came out of the tomb as ordinary men and then ascend up? Or will they become the Adamic man and be on the mount where you can see the throne room of Yah, but you're not in the throne room of Yah? We know the 144,000 do go up and sing with harps in the throne room of Yah. 
But the one-third remnant, the Gentiles called by Yah's name as servants, will they go up as ordinary risen Lazaruses? And Israel, as the Adamic man, as well as the two candlesticks, as the Adamic man? And then the one four four up to the further heaven, opening the windows of heaven to pour out the blessing, opening the seals and the door of heaven. This is the room 101 moment. Tell me your thoughts, family. Let me know in the comments or the chat. Because it says in heaven, we will be like the angels, neither marrying nor giving in marriage. However, in the thousand year reign, they will create children. Let me know your thoughts, fam. So let's return briefly to the birth moment when Yahusha separates the remnant and when the two candlesticks and the two olive trees go to be reborn as they preach the good news and judge the nations with fire. In Revelation 10, what Yahusha says to John after He's got one foot on the ocean and one foot on the land, and he holds his hand up to heaven. Okay, this is in Revelation 10, and I'm going to go over this with you in a second again. So is he says unto me, thou must prophesy again among the people and the nations and tongues and to many kings. So this is the call once Yahusha has gotten victory over the devil and thrown him down, all right, and he's thrown down for all the, the nations to feed on, the, the Leviathan, literally, will be, they'll be feeding on Leviathan. What is said is that he, was then, he then gave me a reed unto a rod, and the angel stood by saying, Rise, and met out the temple of Elohim and the altar of them that worship therein. And so there, this is a great moment of victory. So here is John, and he's going to met out the measure of the temple here, okay? And what has happened is that the people, the two candlesticks and the two olive trees are going to become the temple. Why? What did the Church of Philadelphia say? You will become a pillar in my temple. And so... They are going to go up because the people are the temple of Yahuwah. Behold, your body is the temple of Yahuwah. So now he's measuring the temple. Now he's about to set the standard, the plumb line and the measure by making an example, as I said in the last lesson, putting to death and raising up and creating the temple with the two candlesticks and the two olive trees who become the standard for the temple. They become the vertical measure of the temple that is in heaven and on earth, and they're going to connect the two of them. That's why they have to be raised up from the dead and caught up. When we're talking about the temple being established by Yahusha, we see that he has carved it out with his hands. He has made it. However, there is still a role for the co-workers in Yahusha, the 144, and the two witnesses, and the saved to play. And so we know that tents have cords. Isaiah 4, 0, and 22 says, He sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, and he stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. And of course, all tents have cords. And we see this chord mentioned when Zechariah says, Do not despise small beginnings, for Yahuwah rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. So that was referring to when Zerubbabel and the high priest Yahusha returned to build the temple with Nehemiah and Ezra and all the rest of them. And so Yah rejoiced to see the plumb line in the hand of these leaders who were a kind, you know, the types coming before as the 144. And of course, Ezekiel talks about the man with a measuring line, a line of flax in his hand. And of course, 
This relates again to the chords of righteous because this is how they would do a m vertical measure with cord and a weight to ensure things were flush and perfectly vertical, upright and righteous. And these things are called the chords of the righteous. And so we're going to read a little bit more about the chords of, of the righteous, but I'm showing the, you the parallel here. And so here's more examples you can always pause to read. And again, in Amos 7 and 7, it says that Yahuwah stood upon the wall made by a plumb line in his hand to the window to the wall. So he stands on the wall with a plumb line in his hand. We're going to see that this is all tied into when the witnesses go to testify as they are calling down judgment and as they go down to death, it is Yahusha who will erect the temple, carve it out after he has defeated the enemy in the sea. And while the witnesses give their testimony, he is carving out the mountain city. And this is why he claims just before he sends them off to war, you know, with fire down from heaven, he claims that all things are about to be all finished, okay? And he even says he will set a plumb line in the midst of his people. And he says that there a measuring line shall go forth over and against it and upon the hill of Garib and shall compass about to Goath. So this, these are all mentions and words of this temple that he himself, Yahusha, will construct. And this one you see in the background looks very much like, like the Bayat symbol. All right, so here's the picture again. Yahusha stands with one foot on the land and on the sea. The 144 were selected in chapter 7 of Revelation before crossing over. Israel, Philadelphia is separated as well as it would be, you know, uh, Smyrna. When the angel defeats Satan again, okay? And so this is when he has one foot on the land and one foot on the water. And be, because the scripture says in Ezekiel 20, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith Yahuwah Elohim, and I will cause you to pass under the rod and will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will choose out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. And I will bring them out of the land where they dwell and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And you will know that I am Yahuwah. So it's going to be in crossing over that the rebels are weeded out. And then the church of Philadelphia and Smyrna, the one third remnant and the Gentiles called by Yah's name are set apart says, and I saw an angel stand upon the sea, lift up his hand to heaven. This is Yahuwah, the angel of Yahuwah, which is Yahusha. Family, you cannot understand prophecy if you don't understand the Godhead, and I'm going to, you're going to watch me play this out as we take this journey. And swear by him that liveth forevermore, which created heaven, and the things that, things therein are and the earth and all of the things there therein are in the sea and that all the things there in are that there should be time no more so he has finalized something by doing this act but it's about to be manifest in the natural by the two witnesses and the two candlesticks but in the days of the voice of the seven angel when he shall begin to blow the trumpet even the mystery of elohim shall be finished so, the seventh angel hasn't blown his trumpet yet. So now, family, this is completely revised. It may look familiar to you who saw the two witnesses video about six months ago, but this is now completely different, so pay attention. Those of you who are trying to understand the times, you know, we're entering to the third day and the Shabbat 7,000th year, the 6,000 to 7,000 year reign. And so we're trying to calculate how much time we have left. And this is going to give us an idea because in this time frame, once the 144 and the candlesticks hit 
Jerusalem to testify and call down fire. The clock starts ticking. It's going to be seven plus years until the return of Yahusha, 1,330 some days, according to Daniel. So let's get into it. Whenever you, the angel of Yahuwah appears, very often he's with two flanking angels, like when he visited Abraham and when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So guess who his two flanking angels will be? So at this point, Yahusha's troops are ready in the day of battle because the beast is going to rise up from the sea. But first they have to testify of Yahusha and judge the world and be in Jerusalem where they call fire down from heaven as troops ready in the day of battle. This is the order of events. What happens in Revelation 11, as I said, the temple is measured out. John is measuring out the temple. The temple are the two witnesses and the two candlesticks. And the angel stood by saying, rise and met out the temple of Elohim and the altar. Remember, we said that these are the sacrifice on the altar of the temple. These guys are about to... The two olive trees and two candlesticks about to present themselves as a living sacrifice on the altar, on the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, is cast out and met it not, for it is given to the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be, they shall tread under feet for two and forty months. So this is a time, times, and half a time, and this is the same amount of time that they're going to trample on the temple. The altar is not purified yet, which is the practice before they set up the temple in the wilderness and before they set up the Solomon's temple. They had to purify the altar. This is the eternal temple base. They were about to purify. And so the Gentiles are troddening down around the temple and these witnesses now testify. And this becomes their purification of the altar. So a revelation... Fire comes out of their mouths and they shut heaven. Remember the keys to the kingdom of heaven that only the descendants of David openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. So they have the keys to do this. 101, they're opening a door. But I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, 42 months, same amount of time. That is prophetic days, prophetic years, two, three and a half prophetic years. These are the two olive trees and two candlesticks standing before Elohim of the whole earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouths and devour their enemies. For if any man would hurt them, thus must he be killed. And they have power to what? Shut heaven. All right, room 101. That it rain not in the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with all manner of plagues as often as they will. So now we hold for the picture of the birth of the sun, the purification of the altar. This is when they are fully born now, okay? Because there was blood and there was water crossing over the ocean and now the baby is fully coming out. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon was under her feet, and upon her head was a crown of twelve stars, and she was with child, and the child travailing in birth was pained and ready to be delivered, and there appeared another a wonder in heaven, behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered to devour her child, and when she had brought it forth, so she brought forth a man-child, which should rule all nations with a rod of iron. So she's about to give birth, and they're testifying. Amen. Revelation 11. Back to the two witnesses. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that cometh out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. But after three and a half days, the spirit of life coming from Elohim shall enter into them and they shall stand up on their feet 
and great fear shall come upon them which saw them. And they shall hear a great voice from heaven saying, Come up hither, and they shall ascend up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies shall see them. So this is when the man child is born. Now, didn't we see this same scripture? And I will make them one people in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And the man child was born. And it says, and so she brought forth a man child which should rule all nations with rod of iron, that her child was taken up unto Elohim and to his throne. This is now the blood on the doors, the blood on the doorposts. Tithe this offering, right? This is the tenth, as well as the one third remnant. And goats are included in addition to the other 144 offerings for the altar. So that's the Gentiles. So now instead of Death passing over, death will not pass over, but they will die and be raised to life. And now instead of the door just having blood on it, the doors to heaven will open and the windows of heaven will pour out a blessing, just like when Yahusha went up. Because they ascend up. All of them ascend up afterwards. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of Elohim that they should feed her there a thousand and two hundred and three score days. This is the temple of Yahuwah that is prepared by Yahusha. These are two different things because the 144,000 go up to the throne of Elohim which is actually on the top of Mount Sinai, as we saw before, because when the 70 elders looked up, we're going to see, they see the throne of Mount, on Mount Sinai. All right? But the 144,000 are going to go all the way up to Yah, and the two witnesses are going to go up to the third heaven, but the 144 will go up to the higher heaven. Last time we saw Yahusha, he had his hand raised to heaven, and he had defeated the dragon in the ocean. He goes up to carve out the city on the mountain. Remember, the third heaven is basically where Eden is, upper Eden. And it's where the 70 elders saw Yahuwah in the form of Yahusha standing on the sea of glass. And so that is the third heaven. Okay? But... The actual throne room is the third heaven all the way to the 10th heaven. Enoch says, then the Holy Great One will come forth from his dwelling. and The eternal Elohim will tread upon the earth, even on Mount Sinai, and appear in the strength of his might from the heaven of heaven. On the mountain in the cloud. Second Esdras 13 and 6. The context of this is that Yahusha appears and he graves out a great mountain and flies upon it. And no one can see where that mountain is. So it is hidden. It, it is the unwalled city. Exodus 15 and 7. And this is what corresponds to him graving out, carving out the city of Elohim himself. Because Exodus 15 and 17 says, Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thy inheritance, which is the place that thou hast prepared, O Yahuwah, for to dwell in even the sanctuary, O Yahuwah, which thine hands shall establish. So this is the city that Yahusha himself carves out, the angel of Yahuwah. And what we have in Psalm 68, it says, Though ye have lean among the pots, Ye shall be as the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold when the almighty scattered kings in it. It was white as snow in Salmon. So they have angels' wings now as they go up onto the mountain and up high. So let's see the order of things because remember now, a woman is hidden in the wilderness, so she's gone up to the unwalled city. 
All right. And then the next scripture is she's fed away from the presence of the serpent for three and a half years. And so then the dragon goes to make war with the remnant of the seed that has his commands and the testimony of Yahusha. This is the five churches. And then in Revelation 14, it says, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Remember I said, Mount, so Mount Zion or Mount Sinai. And Revelation 14 and 2, and I heard a voice from heaven as the sound of many waters and the sound of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps and when they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were bought from the earth. So these ones are all the way up in heaven. Okay? They're standing on Mount Zion 144,000 and they are singing with these harps. I'm going to talk to you about that in a second. So what is said is that about the temple, as I said before, it's described as four squared, it shall be doubled, a double blessing of the firstborn. A span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. So this is the 12 times 12, which is 144. Even the very temple in Ezekiel's temple has upper rooms and lower rooms because it's a cube, all right? Four square above and four square below. So like I said, just like Yahusha went up to marry heaven and earth, the 144 are going to do some of that work as well as pillars in the temple that unite the pillars of the temple below with the pillars of the temple in heaven above. So I keep saying there's going to be two heavens, one on earth below and one in heaven above, and then the bride is unified. The two of them are unified in the form of the bride when it comes down from heaven. Now, I did this description about string theory because it talks about sound. This is why they've got the 10 stringed heart that sends them all the way up to the 10th heaven. So both light and sound are forms of energy that travel with waves, but there are vital differences between sound waves and light waves. Sound waves travel at significantly different speeds. Light waves move at speeds that are nearly 1 million times faster than sound waves are capable of traveling. This goes into detail about how they're heard and what their frequencies are and how they travel. But light waves are not atoms, but rather protons. Light is made of discrete packets of energy called protons. Protons carry momentum, they have no mass, and travel at the speed of light. Sound waves are energy being transmitted through a medium such as air or water, and the waves are atoms moving due to energy. In other words, it's a force, it's substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So these are actual atoms of substance rather than light. How does sound, sound travel? Sound travels as waves of energy, but unlike light, the waves transmit energy by changing the motion of particles. Sound energy is the result when a force, either sound or pressures, make an object or substance vibrate. See, they move objects. Sound moves objects and molecules. That energy moves through the substance in waves and those sound waves are called kinetic mechanical energy. And this is what makes substance by the word. So it's like mechanical machines making substance, putting things together. To, that's why faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen family, this is why we use this word ruah or shabak, because it's with a shout that everyone goes up and is transformed with a roar cry. And the ruach obviously means spirit. And so now the song of praise has another power of transformation.
144,000, when they start to harp with these harps, 10 stringed harps, they, it's like the, these sounds become pillars, strings. String theory is based on chords. Yah draws us with chords of kindness. There are chords of righteousness in the book of Enoch that connect us to Yahuwah. And so it is these chords that will draw, the righteousness will draw the lower kingdom of heaven to the upper kingdom of heaven. Am I making sense, family? I hope I am. So it is praise that knits together the kingdom on earth with the kingdom in heaven. And this is the work that the 144,000 do. And it's the work you do when you praise Yah and you dwell in his kabod. And so this is why they're harping with harps and they sing a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were brought from the earth. So at first they're on the mountain, but then they're in the throne room. It's about 45 days later the 144,000 become flying angels, remember, with wings of a dove, gold and silver, and they go out and preach to the nations during what? The Great Tribulation. This is when the trumpets, the last trumpet sounds, number seven, Revelation 14, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud, one sitting like one unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Revelation 14, 20. So now Yah is going to tread the winepress of wrath by himself, as he says. The winepress was then trodden with, without the city, and the blood came out of the winepress unto the horse's bridle by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So remember, the Gentiles were trampling the outer court, and so this is what Yah tramples. Revelation 15, the angel of Yahuwah. And I saw another sign in heaven, a great and marvelous seven angels having seven last plagues, for by them is fulfilled the wrath of Elohim. And I saw, as it were, a glassy sea mingled with fire, and then that had gotten victory over the beast and of his image and of his mark and of the number of his name stand at the glassy sea having harps of Elohim. These are those of the five churches remaining that have had victory over the beast and have sacrificed themselves and are now up in heaven, I believe. Let me know what you think. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of Elohim, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Elohim Almighty. And the temple was full of smoke and the glory of Elohim and of his power. And no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues be finished. Now we already talked about the fact that Enoch and Elijah went up in a huge cloud into heaven. And even Ezekiel said that he beheld a whirlwind out of the north, a great cloud, fire wrapped about it and the brightness that was about it in the midst thereof, and in the midst of the fire came out as the likeness of amber. He's describing the throne of Yah descending and the man clothed in linen. We see very clearly here that heaven is above the firmament, yet Mount Zion and Eden, are. it's the gateway, the access point. Moses was called up on the seventh day, he was called up to the mountain, into the midst of the cloud, and Yahuwah spoke to him 40 days and 40 nights. And we knew that, no, the second time that he had to go and get these tablets again, Yahuwah himself in Exodus 34 and 5 descends in the cloud and stands with Moses and proclaims the name of Yahuwah as he's rewriting the tablets. So now this, this is the great tribulation. And what we see are the churches, the five churches are still out there. Now remember, great signs and wonders, healing the sick, all of these things are going to happen 
in this time. So they're going to be given their own powers. And now as the 144,000 go out and they fly and they preach the good news to the nations in Revelation 14 and 6, they, I believe, will probably also be covering the five churches who are out there still going through the Great Tribulation. Because Yah says he hasn't appointed them unto wrath, right? So they'll be going through the Great Tribulation, but I believe they'll be protected and they'll be fighting demons and casting them down and doing all kinds of stuff. And possibly maybe even the 144, the angels who fly through the heaven with the good news might also be to protect people. I would have to do a deeper study. But anyway, Revelation 16 and 1. And here are those vials of wrath. Because it says, blessed in Daniel, blessed is he who makes it to the 1,335th day. This family, this is more than seven years. Because it was three and a half years that they gave their testimony. And then the woman is hidden in the wilderness for three and a half years. And that is when God, not the first Gog and Magog wars, because there's two of them. But it's after that that they come up. We'll go into that in a second. But Revelation 16 and 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways. And they poured out seven vials of, of the wrath of Elohim upon the earth. Then in Revelation 19, Yahusha comes for the wedding supper. So we had the wine press of wrath. And now we're going to have the wedding supper. And so this is another supper, another bloodbath dinner. All right. And Yahuwah himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of Elohim and the dead in Mashiach shall now rise first. So we go through all of this great tribulation and nobody's repenting and then everybody comes up against Israel. So everyone comes up against Israel. So the woman is fed in the wilderness and it's for 1,000 260 days, a time, times, and half a time, 42 months, three and a half years. But they have to get to the 1,335th day. So there's, so she's there for three and a half years, and then there's going to be 75 days until the end. That is when she's being fed is when the dragon is making war with the churches, the five churches, okay, who are remaining. And they come up in Ezekiel 10. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land that hath no walled towers. And I will go to them that are at rest and dwell in safety, which dwell all without walls and have neither bars nor gates. Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish with all the lions thereof shall say unto thee, Are thou come to take a spoil to the prey? Hast thou gathered the multitude to take a booty, to carry away silver and gold, to carry away cattle and goods, and to spoil a great prey. So who is dwelling with them? Sheba and Dedan. So these are some of the mixed multitude, right, who were in Samaria, and they're with Israel. Sheba and Dedan are the children of Abraham and Keturah, that's Midian, and Tarshish are the Raish, the Tarshish, the Turkish people from that area. So those are the Samaritans. So I believe as well, family, people will be walking in, guiding in into to Eden on the highway of righteousness by the angels and by the spirit of Yahuwah, those of the church and those who are saved of the five churches during this 1,335 days and the 75 days. Then Ezekiel 11, chapter 11. And thou, son of men, thus saith Yahuwah Elohim, speak unto every feathered fowl, to all the beasts of the field, assemble yourselves, come and gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice. For I do sacrifice, a great sacrifice for you upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. So this is the wedding supper. And it lines up with Revelation 7 and Revelation 19, 19. And so this is when Yahusha comes on the clouds for the wedding supper. And now this is Yahusha coming on the mountain and, and he comes with the 144,000 and he comes with the two candlesticks who are up on the mountain. They have already been transformed. 
and they're up on the mountain. So this is what I figured out. What I want you to see, family, so there's these, there are two different sets of being caught up. And one is when the two witnesses and the two candlesticks go up and they ascend up to heaven in the cloud and their enemies see them. And then there is the other one when the five churches who are remaining through the great tribulation get caught up. And you notice how there is the voice of an archangel. There is a shout and there's a trumpet call because it is the end. This is around the time when every knee will bow, but the church is already saved. So these churches who are out there and who are slowly making their way into the mountain of Eden, coming along the highway of righteousness that was set up by those who opened room 101, opened the door to Eden for the righteous to access. That's what they did. And so these will be coming in gradually one by one. And that's what the scripture says. Behold, I will bring you one from a city, two from a family. One by one, I will gather you. So this is the gathering of the churches. And it says, now, when Yahusha appears on the mountain with 144,000 and all the angels to war with the sword of his mouth, then for the five churches, it says, Thessalonians 4 and 17, Yahuwah himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with a voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of Elohim. And the dead in Mashiach shall rise first, then shall we, which are alive and remain, be caught up with them also in the clouds to meet Yahuwah in the air. And so shall we, we ever be with Yahuwah. And Thessalonians 5 further along says, For Elohim hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by the means of of our Yahuwah, Yahusha Hamashiach. This is when the churches are caught up to heaven. This is like a second gathering from the four corners of the earth. And this is all, when all the last, the five Gentile churches are caught up. And again, it's to the mountain. It's not all the way up into the upper heaven because churches like Thyatira will overcome and keep Yahuwah's works unto the end. He who is alive and remains will be caught up in the air, and he shall rule with a rod of iron, as vessels of the potter shall they be broken, even as I received of my father. They shall go in and out, and they shall get the morning star. All right, so they will have defeated Satan, the morning star. And so this is a special Gentile church that gets to dwell in the flesh in the kingdom along with, you know, Smyrna and everybody else. And there are elements of the other churches that do say that they will dwell in the kingdom on earth. So those who died will be in the upper heaven. And remember, there's all these references and this is stuff that happens in Revelation. I'm not covering here. When those who were beheaded for their witness go to the upper heaven, they die and they show up up there. Okay, this upper one. There's on the mountain on the cloud. So remember I said, blessed is he who makes it to the 1,335th day. And so once again, it says, thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance which is the place which thou hast prepared, O Yahuwah, for to dwell in even the sanctuary, O Yahuwah, which thine hands shall establish. So that's the mountain that was carved out in 2nd Esdras. And everyone else who bows and remains will dwell outside of the kingdom in the thousand-year reign in the earth. So remember, I said, family, you are being measured and when we get all the way to Revelation 22, it says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the last seven plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. 
and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven, having the glory of Elohim, and her shining was like unto a stone most precious as jasper, stone clear as crystal, and had a great wall and high, and had twelve gates at the gates, twelve angels, and the names were written, which are the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So these, so these opened heaven's gate and shut it when they were judging, and they will help to marry the upper heaven with the lower heaven. And what we find at the very end of Revelation 22 and 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down from the Elohim out of heaven, prepared as a bride trimmed for her husband. So what seems to happen here is that it says Jerusalem comes from Elohim. When those who go up into heaven who are beheaded for their witness and they are resurrected to they're resurrected to the upper heaven. All right? Amen. They are resurrected to the upper heaven. And it says they, one of these churches, it says their promise, because they're not really doing that well, I <laughs> have to be honest with you. <laughs> not to scare you, but it says, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame, to sit with my father in his throne. So you will be, those who are beheaded and go up into heaven, they will be in Yahuwah's throne. What is that? That's like the tree of life. He is, when Adam and Eve fell, Yahuwah said, they have come out of me. Now will they will be back in him. They will be back in him. And so when we go all of the way to this scripture, then it says the new Jerusalem coming from Elohim out of heaven. So remember I said that we are the temple and then we, we he, Yahushua says he's the vine. You must dwell in him, in his throne. You'll be dwelling in his throne, in him. So this means you're grafted back into the tree of life. You're grafted back into what? The body of Yahushua, who is the body of Yahuwah. And so the bride is, is a kingdom made of a foundation of the 12 apostles. When I, I'm going to do a teaching on the kingdom, but the foundation is the 12 apostles and the 144,000 and the, the 12 elder, tw four and 20 elders. It's made out of the people. And yeah, I'm going to read you something from 2nd Ezra, and this is why the Godhead is so key, because let's read it. This is why the fallen angels do human sacrifice, because that's the body of, yeah, that was what they had. They no longer have that. So 2 Ezra 7 and 29, after these years shall my son Mashiach die, and all men that have life, if you, family, if you believe that Mashiach is a man, because it says, after these years shall my son Mashiach die, and all men that have life. And the world shall be turned into the old or primordial silence seven days, like as in the former judgments, so that no man shall remain. And after seven days, the world that yet, that yet awaketh not shall be raised up and shall die that is corrupt. And the earth shall restore those that are asleep in her, so shall the dust those that dwell in silence and the secret place shall deliver these souls that were committed unto them. And the most high shall appear upon the seat of judgment and the misery shall pass away and the long suffering shall have an end. But judgment 
only shall remain and truth shall stand and faith shall wax strong and the work shall follow and the reward shall be showed and the good deeds shall be of force and the wicked deeds shall bear no rule. So what happens is that everything disappears as including Mashiach. If you're just saved by a man, where'd he go? <laughs> where'd he go? Where did he go, family? I don't know if he's just a man, but if he's, if Yahusha, the spirit, the angel of Yahuwah, Yahuwah, if they're all one, that's who he is. He's, he's restored back into Yah, who creates the new Jerusalem, who is the bride. So if you've been reintegrated back, if you were able to eat from the tree of life in the kingdom of heaven that during the thousand year reign, you have been reintegrated back into the tree of life, who is Yahusha, who is Yah in his throne. Now you are the bride, fully trimmed, who has come down to earth and the upper heaven is united with the lower heaven. And now everything is whole and complete again. You are restored back into what am I always talking about? The image of Yahuwah. Literally, you dwell in him, in his throne, in the vine, in the tree. Yahusha is the root and fatness of the tree. Family, now you are dwelling richly in him as the bride, the body of Yahusha. In Revelation 22, this is what it says. And he showed me a pure river of water of life as clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of Elohim and out of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river was the tree of life. So in the midst of the street or straight way, on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and gave fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees served to heal the nations with. Now here is a picture of a tree that has water of life coming out of it. There's another picture I could show you of a tree that actually is on two sides that splits onto two sides of a waterway. But this is a picture of how the tree of life sits over the earth and the roots below are hell below. All right. Which is where hell and darkness is, is the soil of filth, which the tree grows out of. But remember, death and hell are thrown into the lake of fire. And then it says a river of water comes out of the tree, out from the heavens. And so remember, there were two witnesses who now become one with Yahuwah and Yahusha, who is the great tree of life. So two become one. And remember the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. The tree of knowledge is called the tree of wisdom. It's just a question. Watch my Israel is a great tree series. And I'll show you the scripture where it says that after they eat from the tree of life, after everything is over, they get to eat the tree of knowledge, of wisdom. So there is an order in which you would eat from these trees. And so now there is only one tree. All right, only one tree. Because this that that tree of knowledge was the tree of wisdom that Adam and Eve did eat from. And so we know the scripture says, deep calleth unto deep. And so if death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire, family, is there any more? a hell below or a below at all because in every direction is righteousness 
in there is no down. Now, I, I believe there is a hierarchy in the kingdom of heaven, but I don't believe it's going to be up or down in a vertical way. I'm wondering if this is what the heavens will look like. And so the tree, these are the waters of life, and the tree is on either side of them because the tree of life is below and the tree of life is also above. But that's just my theory, family. But the most beautiful part of all of this is that we are reintegrated back into the body of Yahuwah. And we are living in this eternal world where there is no down, only up and everywhere. So let me know your theory on what this means. A tree pure where the river of water of life is clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of Elohim of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life. So how is it on either side of the river? This is living water. This is the waters above that are good. And there is no below. And so, family, that is how the 144, the remnant, and the two candlesticks opened the windows of heaven and the door and establish the highway of righteousness. And, of course, the 144 go into the upper heaven and heaven and earth marry later. They are caught up to Eden and the third heaven, and the upper heaven, and the five virgins, the five remaining candlesticks, will be caught up in the clouds at the end to reign in the thousand-year reign. Family, thank you for watching, and thank you for your prayers and donations. Go ahead and pick up some swag. You can see it right at the bottom of my channel here, or you can just click through to find it. Please go to Into All Truth and become a member or sign up for our prayer groups. But please continue to support. Go to IntoAllTruth.net and sign up for membership, or just become a subscriber. Pick up the lifestyle book, or the calendar so you can keep these appointed times. May Yah bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine on you. May he be gracious, lift the light of his countenance and give you shalom. Let those that hate thee flee from before thee. Let all of Yasharah, Yisrael, who love, worship, and praise Yahweh, give him thanks by saying hallelujah.